My name is Raywin Campbell and I'm a rhinologist and anterior skull base surgeon in Sydney, Australia. And I'm going to talk about safe and comprehensive endoscopic cytosurgery, landmarks and technique. These are my disclosures. This is an outline to my presentation. And first of all, I'd like to start with an introduction. The endoscopic cytosurgery is very effective in managing many different cytonasal pathologies and has a very high success rate but it's not without its risks. We need a really thorough understanding of the anatomy of each patient. And also we need to practice techniques that avoid mucosal stripping and expose bone. So how do we prepare the nose for our patients and the sinuses before surgery? Well, the nose is one of the most vascular organs we have. It has uh, up to 100 to 200 centimeters squared of mucosa and its blood flow per cubic centimeter is greater than that of muscle, brain and liver. And hemostasis is really important in endoscopic, in endoscopic sinus surgery, not only for visualization, but with bleeding, that leads to at the activation of the coagulation cascade, which then leads to a system of inflammation and fibrosis that feeds off itself. They feed off each other. So we have a look at this bi-directional relationship between coagulation and inflammation. It exists and they both stimulate each other. The problem with this is, that adhesion formations really do depend on a balance between fibrinolysis and fibroblast-derived collagen deposition. And that is really controlled by clot formation and the fibrinous exudate that's secreted at, wound, at the wound site. And if the if spellers, we don't get it right, we're gonna cause adhesions. So if we have inadequate fibrinolysis that leads to ingrowth of fibroblasts and capillaries and neural tissue, which then leads to fibrous connective tissue and adhesions. Now, many of us uh, prepare the nose with a nasal decongestant spray, such as oxymetazoline or xylometazoline. And then we inject with a combination of a local anesthetic with uh, epinephrine or adrenaline sometimes. Now, if we look at the nasal vascular smooth muscle tone, it's controlled by alpha-1 and alpha-2 adrenoreceptors. Now, the alpha-1A adrenoreceptor, if we stimulate that, that causes contraction of arteries. With the 2B, if we stimulate that, that causes contraction of capacitance vessels such as veins and sinusoids. Now, the, if we stimulate the 2B receptor, that causes venoconstriction, but it doesn't lead to any change in arterial inflow. And so we, what we get is an increase in nasal patency, but also an increase in the venous sinusoidal pressure. With the 1A, if we stimulate that, we get arterial vasoconstriction, which leads to a reduction in blood flow. Now, if we look at epinephrine, that's a non-selective alpha-1 and alpha-2 adrenoreceptor agonist. It's equipotent on arteries and veins, and it's a full agonist at both of these receptors. Now, if we look at nasal decongestants like imidazoline or xylometazoline and oxymetazoline, they're non-selective alpha adrenoreceptor agonists compared to, a, and if you compare them to epinephrine, the imidazolines have a higher affinity for these receptors. They're less potent especially at the 1A, which reduces um, arterial inflow, and they're less efficacious. So imidazolines are mostly venoconstrictive. They block the effects of epinephrine. They're less potent and efficacious compared to epinephrine, and they last for up to 12 hours. Now, if you inject with one in 100,000 or one in 200,000, the impact on the hemodynamic parameters is essentially the same. Also, if you inject and use a topical combination of epinephrine, really they're not different, no different to using topical alone, except if you do the combination of an injection and topical, the operating time is shorter. Topical one in 2000 adrenaline is more effective than topical one in 10,000 adrenaline. And whether you use one in 1000 or one in 2000 topically, it neither of them lead to an acute change in cardiovascular parameters. I like to use rapivacaine because it's more potent than lidocaine. It does have a cardiotoxic metabolite, but it is less arrhythmogenic and has less cardiac depression than bupivacaine. And if you co-administer it with a vasoconstrictor such as epinephrine, that can prolong the effect and slow the absorption of the local anesthetic. Now I'd like to talk about landmarks in endoscopic sinus surgery. And initially we'd start with a CT scan because up to 58% of our patients are gonna have a significant anatomic variation that impacts our surgery. Also early CT scans reduce inappropriate antibiotic use. 
Interestingly, the lung Mackay score correlates with nasal discharge and obstruction, but it doesn't correlate with disease, disease severity. When I look at the CT, I apply the CLOSE principle, which stands for cribriform plate, laminar paparatia, anodes fell, sphenoid sinus pneumatization and skull base, and the anterior ethmoid artery. So with the cribriform plate, we're essentially assessing the depth and symmetry of the plate, as this is the most vulnerable site of the anterior skull base for injury. With the laminar paper ratio, you're looking to see if it's dehiscent and also the shape of it, so you can avoid injury during sinus surgery. Now, when I look at the laminar, I also look at the unsinet process to ensure that it's not adherent to the orbital wall, for example, in, sinus, in silent sinus syndrome. Now, O stands for optic nerve and anode cell, and you want to see if the optic nerve is dehiscent and if the um, anterior process is well pneumatized. You also want to see if there's an anode cell or not, so that you can ensure you know where you are when you're in this cell and you don't mistake it for a posterior ethmoid cell and go through it and injure the optic nerve or carotid artery. When you're looking at the sphenoid sinus, you're seeing how well pneumatized it is, but you're also looking to see if the septum is attached to the internal carotid artery, which occurs in approximately 49% of people. You also want to see if the skull base is dehiscent and the slope of the skull base so that when you enter the sphenoid sinus, you're not going to injure it. E stands for the anterior ethmoid artery to see, and you want to see whether that's on a mesentery or not, which can occur in up to 60%, 67% of people in some studies. So this is just a summary of the close principle, looking at what anatomic structure, imaging plane and items you need to evaluate. Now I'd like to talk about surgical safety zones. And these are essentially defined by some key landmarks, such as the middle turbinate and superior turbinate, the orbital wall and the skull base, as well as the skull base posteriorly. We identify these by performing sequential sinus surgery, by first identifying the unsinate process, then the maxillary sinus, the ethmoid bulla, basal lamella of the middle turbinate, the lamella of the superior turbinate, sphenoid sinus and then dissecting along the skull base. So with the unsinate process, this is part of the ethmoid bone. And in Latin, it actually means a hook-like bend. And this is the first step in endoscopic sinus surgery. And if we don't do this correctly, you could injure the orbit or the lacrimal duct and also your maxillary sinus osteotomy is going to fail. The unsinate process extends from the frontal recess into the uh, inferior terminate. And its free edge creates a space between the inferior turbinate and bulla, which is called the hiatus semilunaris. And as you can see, it hides the ostium to the maxillary sinus. The unsinate process it can attach to a varying different locations, such as the skull base, middle turbinate, or the lamina papyracea. And this is a lateral view with the middle turbinate removed, showing the hiatus semilunaris. So this is uh, the unsnip process, and this is the uh, area that you essentially want to remove. And here's a video of that, using a ball probe to identify it posteriorly, and then a back biter to, back, to bite it all the way back to its attachment, and then to fracture it medially and use a cutting instrument to then remove it. With the maxillary sinus, by opening this, this actually allows us to identify the orbital floor. It also helps us to identify the, the level of the sphenoid ostium and gives us a safe distance from the skull base. So with the maxillary sinus, you confirm the opening, but don't stretch it too far or you will strip mucosa from the roof. You then using a through cutting instrument to cut back and then a back biter to bring it along anteriorly, being careful that you don't extend that into the superior aspect of the inferior terminate. Once you've done this, you can identify the orbital floor and the lowest point of the skull base is never below this point. So it's a fantastic landmark. It's also in line with the sphenoid ostium, and it's a very safe if you, you're very safe if you stay below the roof of the maxillary sinus, which you can see here. The next step is we want to identify the ethmoid bulla here. And that's either one or many cells. Its posterior wall is separate from the ground lamella, and you have posterior to it an area called the retrobulla recess. Now the bulla does often extend to the skull base and it forms the posterior limit to the frontal recess. Although if it doesn't extend to the skull base, it forms a suprabulla recess and that's where the anterior ethmoid artery can be found. So this is the ethmoid bulla here, both endoscopically and on a CT scan, 
And this is what you want to remove um, as part of your ethmoidectomy. This is a video showing entering it uh, posteriorly and medially. And then you use through cutting instruments to make what we call a mucosal soup, which avoids uh, mucosal stripping. And once you've done this, you can then use your debrider to clear up the area that of your mucosal soup. And then you'll be, have the lamina papyracea identified. As you can see here, this is the lamina or the medial orbital wall, which is our lateral landmark. Now the middle turbinate can be thought of in four parts. It's anterior attachment, the sagittal plane, it attaches to the cribriform plate, in the vertical plane, the lamina papyracea, in the horizontal plane, the lateral nasal wall, and it divides the anterior and posterior ethmoids, which is really determined by mucus drainage patterns. So when you go through the basal lamella of the middle turbinate, you'll then enter into the posterior ethmoid sinus. And you can, when you enter into this area, you could use the orbital floor or the roof of the maxillary sinus as the level to enter into this area and you will not injure the skull base. Everything below the level of the orbital floor is safe with regards to the skull base. So now we're entering into the posterior ethmoid sinuses and we have the medial wall of our surgical box defined with our superior and middle turbinate. Now the superior turbinate shares an attachment with the middle turbinate and it lies in the same sagittal plane. It also attaches to the face of the sphenoid sinus and the sphenoid sinus ostium is posterior medial to the superior turbinate in the majority of patients. This is a, a example of where the sphenoid sinus ostium is and you can see it's in line with the roof of the maxillary sinus. Now the sphenoid sinus ostium location is predominantly in the middle third in the sagittal plane. In the coronal plane, it's either in the medial or the middle third as well. And it's about 7.45 millimeters below the skull base. So once we found our sphenoid cavity, we now have the posterior wall of our surgical box identified. So we have the posterior skull base, the lamina papyracea, middle turbinate, superior turbinate and septum as our medial walls, the anterior skull base and the sphenoid sinus identified. And now we know where we can safely dissect without injuring any important structures. So on a final view, this is the middle turbinate, which are inferior turbinates, which has been reduced, the maxillary sinus, the sphenoid sinus. As we now look up, we can see the skull base with the posterior ethmoid and anterior ethmoid arteries looking towards the posterior wall of the frontal sinus and the frontal sinus itself. Now with frontal sinus dissection, I just wanted to go through a little bit of terminology first. The frontal sinus um, ostium is the most narrow area of transition from the frontal sinus to the recess. Um, anteriorly you have the frontal sinus beak and the um, ostium is the most inferior margin of the frontal sinus and it is perpendicular to the posterior wall of the frontal sinus. The frontal recess is the space into which the frontal sinus drains. It's the most antero superior part of the ethmoid, inferior to the frontal sinus ostium. And it's occupied by a whole host of different cells which can determine the direction and position of the drainage pathway. In fact, I'd now like to talk about some surgery terminology in frontal sinus surgery. With a draft one, that's an anterior ethmoidectomy without touching the frontal sinus outflow tract. A draft 2A is an anterior ethmoidectomy, but you are then clearing the frontal sinus outflow tract from the middle turbinate to the lamina papyracea. Draft 2B involves a draft 2A, but you also clear the outflow tract from the nasal septum to the lamina papyracea. A draft 3 or modified endoscopic lothrop procedure or frontal sinus drill out involves a superior septectomy and removing the floor of the frontal sinus anterior to the middle turbinate and first olfactory neurons from lamina papyracea to lamina papyracea and also removing the frontal sinus septum. And there is a classification system for frontal sinus surgery, which accounts for anatomic configurations and degree of difficulty. It permits a graduated progression for trainees, aids in communication between surgeons, and it also improves reporting outcomes. And essentially it grades it into six different, um, zero to six, six different classifications. Now zero to three is essentially surgery in the frontal recess rather than the frontal sinus itself. 
and it involves dilating or fracturing cells that obstruct the drainage pathway without actually enlarging the bony frontal sinus ostium. When we move from grades four to six, that actually involves removal of bone to enlarge the frontal sinus ostium. There's also a modified hemilothrop, which is essentially a draft 2B and a superior septectomy, which will, is very good for unilateral disease. And the septectomy allows you to access uh, the, con the uh, frontal sinus via the contralateral nasal cavity. It's, it's not a bad option for mucosils or solid lesions in the supraorbital region or unilateral inflammatory sinus disease. Another uh, option is the Carolyn's window, which is similar to a unilateral drill out or a draft 2A with an axillectomy. And this is a video, care of Richard Harvey, using a, a needle tip diathermy to raise a flap. And this flap goes then along the superior aspect or the roof of the nasal cavity, almost to the piriform aperture. And then that's the posterior limb. And you then elevate the flap and push it down into the nasal cavity so it doesn't get in the way of your drilling. The next step is you're going to drill that bone over the uh, lacrimal sac and the axilla and the front face of the sphenoid, uh, oh sorry, of the frontal sinus. And you can see at the end of this, you have a nice entry into the frontal sinus and you can replace the flap back to improve healing. Now there's some unique properties of the frontal sinuses. It's the most narrow sinusotomy and the most prone to stenosis. It's very unforgiving. The smallest amount of mucosal stripping can lead to stenosis. And the frontal sinus is in an antero superior location in the frontal recess. And it's also an hourglass shape, which is why it makes it quite difficult for us to access surgically. There's also a whole host of cells that can narrow this recess and make the surgery quite difficult. In fact, there's a classification system of the various different types of cells, which I encourage you to read. Interestingly, also the frontal bone is thicker in women but frontal sinuses are larger in men. With stenosis of the frontal sinus, the failures are most likely to occur within the first year. When you've done frontal sinus surgery, you need to account for the fact that there'll be a 33% reduction in the size of the ostium that you create. In fact, the only factor that influences the final diameter is the size that you achieve at the end of your surgery. The neo-ostium you create reduces in size for up to two years after surgery. And after that point, any stenosis is usually due to disease recurrence. With a draft 2A or 2B, we really should aim for a threshold sinusotomy size of four to five millimeters. If you have a size that's less than five millimeters, there's a 30% chance it's going to stenose. Less than two millimeters, at least a 50% chance it's going to stenose. So it's important we identify patients whose frontal outflow tracts are narrow. And if we're not going to get a sinusotomy of greater than four to five millimeters, we should really be avoiding doing a draft 2A or 2B in these patients and look at doing some other type of frontal sinus surgery. And as you know, one of the most common reasons for failed sinus surgery is incomplete surgery. Other causes of failed sinus surgery include failure to identify pertinent anatomy, lateralized middle term, mucosal stripping, disease recurrence, or not using grafts over areas of exposed bone. So in conclusion, for safe and effective sinus surgery, it's important to prepare the nasal mucosa to minimize bleeding, to carefully review the CT scan using the close principle or equivalent, to systematically identify landmarks to establish your surgical box, and to practice mucosal preservation techniques. Also, you want to aim for a frontal sinus ostium that's greater than four to five millimeters. And remember that most frontal sinus failures occur within the first year. If you use mucosal grass or flaps over exposed bone, that will reduce the rate of stenosis. We need to also consider a change in philosophy that we're moving beyond targeted surgery to treat a physical condition, such as relieving osteobstruction and to improve ventilation and drainage and to treat a CT scan. This isn't effective. What we really need to move on to is to the mucosal concept where we're surgery is providing access for topical therapies. It's also removing hypersecretory mucin and inflammatory products and we're actually treating the disease rather than the scan and anatomy. This is some suggested reading and also uh, my sources. Thank you very much.